only mode. Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Kathy Schick, I'm an educator from Eastern Pennsylvania. I also work with NC3T. And recently there's been a lot of buzz about the release of a new book, The Power and Promise of Pathways, and today I'm really excited to talk to author Hans Meter, who is the co-founder and president of NC3T, or the National Center for College and Career Transitions. NC3T is a mission-driven organization seeking to communicate the urgency and benefit of the Pathways model and develop the capacity of local leaders to take action on a pathway system agenda. Today we welcome your questions if we have time. We don't want to keep anyone too late or too long. We know how busy you are. If you have a question, we'd like you to type it into the question box on your um, dashboard and we'll uh, Check with this. Uh, check the question box at the end, and see if we have time to answer a few. Let me tell you a little bit about Hans. Hans has an extensive and varied career in education and workforce policy and government leadership, with an emphasis on high school redesign, career and technical education, and workforce quality. Prior to his work with NC3T, Hans was deputy assistant secretary for education in the U.S. Department of Ed. Office of Vocational and Adult Education. Other roles have included Director of the 21st Century CTE Leadership Initiative, Senior VP for Workforce Development and Post-Secondary Learning at the National Alliance of Business, Executive Director of the 21st Century Workforce Commission, and Education Policy and Outreach Director for the House of Representatives Committee on Education and Workforce. Hans lives in Columbia, Maryland, with his wife Lisa, with whom he's raised and launched four adult children. I think he should get an award for that. And recently Hans and Lisa welcomed their first grandchild. I have on good authority the most adorable baby in all of the world. So Hans, welcome and congratulations on the new book. Thank you so much, Kathy. And I do affirm we have the cutest grandbaby. He, he really actually is. I've seen pictures. <laughs> he, he ranked right up there. Uh, so I'm going to start, Hans, with first things first. Uh, the term pathways, it's a real popular term in education these days, but uh, as you know, there's some confusion as to its meaning. So let's start with the basics. How do you define pathways? Great question. And in some ways, it's, uh, it's a little difficult sometimes to, to get people on the same page. Uh, so I did a little exercise based on something I'd read recently about creating an elevator speech where you kind of describe your product, what you're trying to communicate or sell. You describe the problem, you describe the proposed solution, and you describe the benefit. So let me just take a sh shot at sharing that elevator speech. Hi, I'm Hans Meter, and I'm promoting the power and promise of Pathways. Too many students don't understand how education connects to their future or how to make good decisions about careers in college. In the Pathways system approach, students learn about career options, they see the world of work, they try out career programs, and they learn to make smart decisions. Through the Pathways systems approach, school starts to make sense and students start to work harder and they make smoother transitions to college and good careers, which leads them to a better life. So that kind of gets at the essence of, of what a pathways approach is all about. It's not real specific, but the idea that students are learning about career options. They're actually getting to experience the world of work in different forms. And then they're trying out career programs. So sometimes when we think about pathways, we're thinking about the specific program, the programmatic experience, and that's certainly part of it. But it's more than that. So that ultimately they're learning to make really good decisions. So when we think about pathways, we actually talk about six components of a pathway system. 
uh, that, that gives you those results of better decision making, smoother transitions. So the six components that we cover and talk about in the book are defining what is the outcome of a student who's ready to move forward for career and life success. Uh, secondly, what does a good career development program look like that's not just happening at the high school level, but really is being students are young, youngsters are learning about careers, they're exploring careers, they're learning about themselves, so that when they get to the high school level, they can go deep and uh, do more exploration through a, a particular pathway program. So that's career development. The third element is the actual pathway program of study. And we have some criteria that we've put together about 12 different components to look for in a high quality pathway program. And then teaching and learning, dynamic teaching and learning that uses problems and questions and experience to really activate engagement for the students. So that's an important part of the pathway system. Uh, fifth is having very thoughtful, structured employer and community engagement. And then the last element is building sustainable connections between your K-12, your post-secondary partners, your career technology center, uh, other uh, work, education workforce, and economic development partners in the community. So building a, a partnership structure that extends just beyond your school system. So those are, uh, we talk about the pathway program and then we also talk about the pathway system. Mm -hmm. which, is, which is what makes this book so comprehensive, I think. There's, you know, it, it does focus not only, like you said, on isolated pathways, but also on developing a, a very comprehensive pathway system. So Hans, we know um, we're both, we've both been around the block enough to know there's a lot of stakeholders involved in education. So who specifically did you have in mind? Who's the intended audience for this book? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, there, there's some really good pathway books that have been written over the last few years that were mostly aimed at state policy makers and decision makers. And for this book, I thought there was a real need to have something written for the local leader. And I'd say there's kind of three primary readers that are going to benefit from this book. Uh, one is someone who's in a school level and they're a school principal or an assistant principal, or they want to just move something in their particular school. And then secondly, is someone within a school district, a superintendent, an associate superintendent, who's been charged with trying to make something around pathways um, emerge at a district level. And then third would be an active, engaged community leader who really cares about education, cares about young people. So it could be perhaps someone at a chamber of commerce or a community foundation. Uh, but it's really aimed uh, at the action point is what's happening at the local level. And we, we put, place a big emphasis on the importance of local leadership. And uh, Jim Clifton, who's cited in the book, Jim Clifton is the head of the Gallup organization. He wrote a great book a couple years ago called The Coming Jobs War. And he said, don't wait for Washington to provide the answers. Uh, and sometimes on either end of the political spectrum, sometimes we're, we're wanting Washington to have another program or an, uh, another way of solving problems. And, and on the other end of the spectrum, some people think that Washington is the cause of all of our problems. Uh, we really embrace the idea of local leaders can get it done uh, in spite of either good or bad policy from Washington. And that's really what the, the theme of the book is, is, is about and who the audience for the book is. And, and I would have to say having facilitated and, and been a part of many book studies in, in education, I think this would be a great book um, to purchase for different administrators, lead teachers, business partners, and do some sort of informal read-along or book study. It just has that much in it. Yeah, thank, uh, one of the, just on that point, one of the things we'll be developing very shortly is a discussion guide to go with the book because we think it'll be excellent for that, for that uh, use. That's great. So as I said, there's a lot of information in the book. It's uh, over 300 pages. It's very thorough. Chapters include uh, why pathways matter, pathways essentials, designing the pathway system, advancing the pathways movement, 
overall, Hans, with all of the information that's in this book, if you had to narrow it down, what would you say is the challenge or the problem that the book is addressing? I kind of hinted at that in, in that uh, elevator speech, that too many students don't understand how education today connects to their future or how to make good decisions about careers in college. And so then we see that kind of playing out through a lot of different symptoms. So the first couple chapters really lay out what are some of the symptoms we're seeing and then what are some of the root causes. Uh, but I'd say four symptoms that are, are really uh, endemic that re require something different than what we're doing with education. Uh, right now, only about 40% of our young adults are finishing some sort of uh, formal college degree program or associate degree program. As much emphasis as, as we put on trying to get more young people to enroll in college and to get lots of college loans out there, um, a lot of them are just drifting in and out of college and not finishing. And part of that is that there's a college readiness problem that among all the people taking the ACT and the SAT, only about 40% of them are actually ready to do college level work. And that's according to SAT and ACT's own analysis. So uh, there's, there's an, an, an amount, there's a level of lack of preparation as well as lack of understanding about what college and post-secondary education can provide. Uh, we still have a big problem with high school completion. It certainly has gotten a lot better than it was. Uh, but when you look at all the young people across America who are disconnected, they're either not going to some sort of post-secondary education training or they're not in school and they're not working, that's five million people, which is about the population of Minnesota. So that's a problem. And then a, a fourth uh, symptom is that employers say that me even many of the young people coming out of post-secondary education aren't truly ready for the workforce. And there's a lot of jobs that are going unfilled that are really good jobs, skilled jobs, but young people either don't know about them or don't know how to get them and get prepared for them. So those are some of the symptoms that we're seeing out in the workforce and workplace of people not really being ready for college, not completing college. And when I use the term college, you should well know that I don't mean just the university because that's actually one of the symptoms is that there's been a very strong university for all approach, but most of the good jobs require some sort of post-secondary education training beyond high school. And it's what, so the essence of what the Pathways approach does is, is create a better structure and better approach for helping young people learn about careers and learn about options while they're in high school so they make better, success, more successful transitions. Thanks, Hans. I was also going to clarify when you were saying college, I know that's really important to you and the work you do is that uh, we're not advocating for your university for all, but post-secondary planning and, and options um, for all. I was going to ask you um, why you believe this message is important now, but I think you've really just captured that. So I think for anyone who is trying to um, communicate Path, the need for pathways, the benefits of pathways to their stakeholders. I think you just captured all that when you were talking about, you know, um, you and I both have a child, at least one, who's graduated from college and one still in college. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. we, we see all these uh, roadblocks, the, you know, getting into college, being ready, um, finishing, and, and being ready for the workforce. So I think you've answered that. So I think I'm going to ask um, another question, maybe that you can clarify it for us. Uh, when people first hear about pathways, they usually have some questions, and one of them is typically this. Aren't pathways just the new way to track students? In my day, that was college prep, or at the time called VOTEC, now called Career and Technical Education. Or So, so are, are pathways really just tracking in a better package, Hans? That's a very common question. It was one of the blogs I wrote recently was one of the most frequently asked questions. And because people will tend to refer back to the mental model that they already understand and know about. And that certainly was the reality in the past, uh, that some students were encouraged 
to go into college and go a college prep route. And some students were encouraged to not aspire to, quote, college, but to something other than that. Um, and we, the reasons were that, you know, guidance counselors and, and other adults either thought they really didn't have what it took, or maybe there was just some, some discrimination going on, some predispositions that certain people were college material and others weren't. So the reality of today's workforce is that uh, there's, it's not as cut and dried as some people go to college, some people don't go to college. It's much more of a continuum of post-secondary education and training options. Um, and all of those options require strong learning skills, problem solving skills, communication skills. That's one of the big disconnects why I think a lot of students are tuning out is that they have already written a mental script for whatever reason that I'm not going to college or university. Therefore, I can slack off. I can take it easy. Um, and but the reality is that every good job is going to require skills and it's going to require both kind of the personal, the academic the learning skills, interpersonal skills and technical skills. And it's going to require some sort of education training beyond high school. Um, so uh, so the track, it's really more of a continuum of options versus tracking. And that's what the pathways approach is. We encourage every pathways program to very explicitly lay out how could a student move along in this pathway and then pursue a, 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 a four-year university degree? How could they pursue a cert certification or a two-year degree? And are there any options within this pathway for direct entry into the workforce? There may or may not be, but we think that the pathways will be much more um, attractive to students at all achievement levels and aspiration levels if we show the different points at which they can pursue that pathway. And, and we know, Hans, we've come across students um, who have said that pathways not only helped them get a sense of what they might be interested in beyond high school, but it also has helped some kids clarify what they thought they were interested in really isn't. So, um, you know, a good career mm -hmm program gets a, gets a student out in a, in a job shadow or a, a build, a, an industry tour of some sort. And for some kids, that's really, you know, gives them the idea that, hey, I'm not interested in medicine like I thought I might have been. So Right, right. Yeah, the other, the other real advantage and, you know, all the students that I've talked to that said, you know, I really didn't think I was interested in doing some sort of education beyond high school because I was bored with high school. But then when I got in this program, I started enjoying it and really realizing I'm not stupid. I can learn. So it's uh, it's not only is it a, not tracking, it's actually the opposite of tracking. Schools that are using pathway programs typically see an uptick in the percentage of their graduates that go on to successfully go into post-secondary education and training. So kind of piggybacking off of the question of, of tracking, which you've clarified, do you expect any other pushback from the book? Or what, what might that be and how would you respond? Yeah, well, I think the typical pushback is going to be that people have a mental model that um, one is that university for all is really what's best for young people. I heard a college president on a local public radio station saying, well, we know that college graduates, four year degree graduates earn so I'll say make it up 15% more than others. So why don't we just have more people graduating from college? And this university president who should know the basics of supply and demand didn't seem to understand that. That if you have a glut of people with the wrong types of degrees, then their education actually becomes less valuable. And then we, and it just exacerbates the shortage of the kind of uh, jobs that are widely available that are very high skilled jobs but don't require a university degree. Um, so I just lost my train of thought. Could you restate the question? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about the, the, the pushback. What yeah. Do you okay, so pushback. So this university president would, has a mindset that's going to push back against what he considers vocational training. And you really just have to kind of uh, engage in the facts about our current workforce and what leads to success. And then um, I think probably there's going to be some if you just have a career exploration and career development approach, 
where students are just taking a few assessments and learning about careers and you don't really challenge the way some of your high school courses are organized and why don't we take these electives and actually start to organize those into a sequence of courses that uh, gets deeper and deeper as you go forward. Um, you know, maybe we're going to work to have more than 10% of our students get a work-based learning experience. So when you start to actually challenge and, and rethink the way the school day happens, the way school is structured, uh, it may not be pushback per se, but it's going to be some you're going to be turning over some some traditions that uh, people um, you know might be concerned about and so that's why one thing i was really excited about with the book is that we don't just talk about how to design a great pathway program or a pathway system we have a whole chapter on leadership skills how to grow as a as, as a leader in your own right and developing your own emotional intelligence and aspiring to level five leadership as Jim Collins coined it. But then also how do you lead an effort around change? How do you build a coalition? How do you communicate the vision? How do you uh, claim some short term wins and then keep moving long term? Because that is really an important piece of any kind of pathway system component. So those are the, so you're going to get some pushback. There's some people that are very quick to jump on the bandwagon of something new and innovative. And then you've got some people who really have to be brought along slowly to, to understand. So a good leader is going to really take the time to not just say this is what we're doing, but to go back to some of those earlier parts of the book and say this is why we're doing it. And this is how this Pathways approach is going to help all of our students both our middle achieving and low achieving students, but also our kind of high achieving students are going to be even more focused and more well prepared for where they go after high school. You mentioned electives, and by the way, there's a question uh, pending about electives, so we'll come back to that. Hopefully right. we'll have a chance to do that. Um, so uh, just real briefly, Hans, you know, talking about the pushback, on the other side of the spectrum, there are a lot of schools across the country. I know I've seen a lot here in Pennsylvania that are um, already quote unquote doing pathways to some degree. So for those schools who may be on the call and already engaged in pathways, uh, is your book going to help them move forward or is this really a, a beginner's guide book? I think the book will take you as deep as you need to go. Uh, because we've organized it where we we deal with developing a great pathway program, which is kind of where some people are. They just want to have a really good engineering program or a, a health science program or an ag bio program. They're going to get what they need to look at those 12 components of a high quality program and, and do some planning and benchmarking around that. But if they also want to take a board, more of a systems approach, then they'll have the the, 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 what they need to think about with a career development plan and what they need to do to, to align their teaching and learning and their employer community engagement. So uh, it does give people uh, as much or as little as they want in terms of, um, so it's, it's 101, but it probably is 101 through 401, uh, depending on where you are in the process. Great. So Hans, You've also started a new blog, and uh, I bet a lot of the people on the call right now, oops, you have a, there we yeah. go. Uh, a lot of people on the call probably are familiar with the NC3T blog, but recently you've um, sort of updated this blog, and it's now called the Pathways Sherpa. I think we have a slide on it. There we go. Um, there we go. I love the look of this blog. So, Hans, tell me what, your, what you see your role as in the Pathways movement. This book means a lot to you. Pathways is your passion. Tell us why you wrote this book and created the Pathways Sherpa. Um, what's your role? Sure. Um, well, I've, been, I've had a pretty eclectic career, and you kind of hinted at that when you read my bio at the beginning of the session. Um, I've, I've worked in Congress as a staff member. I've worked at the U.S. Department of Education in a couple different venues for uh, a business-led education advocacy organization. And then for the last 10 years, I've been working in the, in the field where things really matter at the state and local levels around education reform. Um, and along the way, really got introduced to this idea of doing high school differently. 
Uh, and, and one thing, I'll just step back and note that this book looks at pathways more from a high school perspective. Uh, but we know that there's a, a very valuable uh, kind of parallel work happening for adult learners. And a lot of the things in the book do touch uh, and, and transition nicely. So you can read the book and get a lot out of it that's going to help you working with your adult learners as well. We expect to be focusing on adult learners in some future work. But this is more focused on that high school. So doing high school differently. Um, and because of those different vantage points, I was able to not only just learn one approach to doing high school differently, but to, to look at multiple approaches from Nashville to p -Tech to Florida. Uh, I've been in every state in the union over the last 15 years and I've just seen amazing things and, saw, and talked to hundreds and thousands of people who are doing this kind of work. So it really did give me, uh, I think, a fairly unique vantage point to write this book. It's the way I said it, it's been 10 years in the making and two years in the writing. Um, and, uh, and it really does, I think, give people one thing from seeing all those different approaches and, and perspectives. And then we've been working directly with school districts in, in several states. We realized that we didn't need a formula, we needed a framework. And so instead of just a very specific um, set of ingredients and you mix them together in this way. We needed something that was more of a framework that teams can take and then apply it and customize it to fit their particular needs. So the Pathway Sherpa, what this does is try to then bring kind of a day-to-day -day conversation to the ideas that are in the book. Uh, and the Pathway Sherpa, again, is aimed primarily at that local leader who's implementing Pathways work. And we're going to be breaking some of those ideas into smaller chunks and nuggets to think about. We're also going to be starting to do, similar to this conversation, podcast discussions with leaders who are doing the work around the country to go deeper and hear their perspectives and have this kind of ongoing conversation. So that's really the purpose of the Pathway Sherpa blog. As most of you know, a Sherpa, and I don't look anything like a Sherpa, but a Sherpa is a is a uh, is a you know tribe in the Himalayas of people that specialize in helping people navigate and uh, and climb these incredible uh, mountains in the Himalayas, and so it's. You, Someone like me can't do the work for you, but I hope I can help you and give you guidance and information and support as you're doing the work. And I know you'll also, you, uh, in addition to the Sherpa and um, working with a lot of states, you'll also do keynotes and, and other um, workshops and so forth mm -hmm. to help people right. move, move this forward. So Hans, um, I'm going to ask you to go to the slide or ask whoever's moving the slides to the, um, the slide of there it is. Thank you. So, if you're, we want people to know the book is um, just will be released very shortly. Um, there will be bulk rates available, and on our website at nc3t.com, you can go ahead and pre-order. But while people are looking at that, Hans, I wanted to again remind people to submit their questions. Um, and Hans, I'm going to uh, read a question to you from Steve. Have you come across any research regarding our current elective system? Typically, high schools have a business department, a family and consumer science department, etc. Aren't the pathways redefining the old elective system? Uh, yeah. I don't think I've seen specific research, but in our work, what we've done with, with a number of schools is basically take the course catalog and rethink the course catalog around um, around pathway clusters and then individual pathway programs. So uh, typically you can, uh, depending on how strong your electives already are, uh, you've got a lot to work with. And so a business and finance cluster is very doable. Uh, engineering, manufacturing, uh, information technology, that uh, information technology can sit in a couple different clusters, uh, but but it could either sit in the business of finance and information technology, or it can be more in the kind of engineering manufacturing side. Then you've got the, the health and science side, and you've got uh, the kind of the liberal arts and uh, 
perhaps social services or human services. Uh, so there's a lot that you can do with typical high school to start to reorganize those electives. And, and we, we point out that pathways can certainly be very career directed and those can build on career technical education programs, but then you can also have pathways that are more of a theme, more thematic. Um, and the way we lay out the 12 components can work for either a career specific or a themed pathway. Thanks, Hans. Um, another question from Delilah. Uh, what you are describing for the most part is CTE. How are pathways different from career and tech ed programs? Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah, and I think uh, I kind of just ad addressed that, but probably the other, th the other way in which pathways at, at their best can be different from CTE is that you're not only looking at that sequence of three or four uh, courses that make up your CTE sequence, but then you're also creating a team of teachers within a pathway uh, group and you're starting to look for opportunities for cross-curricular connections with your social studies teachers, with uh, your English teachers, and to some degree with your math and your science teachers. Uh, as well as with uh, a school counselor to be part of that team. So you're starting to build a team of teachers that's interdisciplinary around that pathway theme. But then you're also very explicitly bringing the employer engagement piece into that. Uh, and really employer engagement, employer engagement is, is two ways. One is getting students outside of your school so they can see workplace and starting with something pretty, a light touch, a, a workplace tour, a short job shadow experience, leading to something when they're older, more mature, that is more like an internship or a mentorship that has a little bit longer length to it, a little more commitment to it. And then the other way is to get employers into the classroom. So they're coaching projects, perhaps they're teaching some new technologies or they're teaching some new business processes or they're just talking about their career. So uh, integrating the work-based learning experiences to that, the interdisciplinary nature of a pathway, those are how pathways extend beyond just being a sequence of career technical courses. And, and Hans, um, Cynthia made a comment, the 16 national career cluster uh, fits nicely within the five CTE program areas. That's right. Yeah, uh, 16 clusters is was created at the national level to help organize career pathways, but it's a little too much for the average school to work with. So uh, the Minnesota, for instance, and several other states developed a six cluster model that they that they included those 15 into and other places I think Pennsylvania has had has identified five clusters and it may not be possible for a school to one approach perhaps is that you have students kind of identify their area of interest in one of those five clusters now the school may not be large enough to actually offer a program in each of those clusters, but a good first place to start is for the students to identify an area of interest and to at least choose their courses based on that area of interest. And then as possible, you start to reorganize your electives or create new electives. One of our model schools that we really like to talk about is Salverson Area High School in Pennsylvania. And as they did this work, over the course of a, you know, four or five years, they introduced a lot of new courses, particularly STEM courses and AP courses that they built into their pathway sequences. So it's not something that you'll do overnight, but by first kind of organizing your, 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 your um, career development work around these clusters and then starting to organize programs around the clusters, you can kind of build it out incrementally. Hans, I'm going to make this our final question. Does the book provide examples of well-established pathways, uh, for example, an education pathway where we, I assume the school is also the employer as well? Uh, the, the book has some about eight different case studies of really interesting things happening around the country in terms of school districts and specialty schools and specialty programs that will give really good examples of what the Pathways model looks like. Um, 
the actual sequences of courses and what that looks like, we don't offer that in the book itself. But those will be kind of uh, ancillary things that will be made available through the Pathway Sherpa website. Uh, there's another way you can access information about the book uh, directly, just called the power and promise of pathways.com but they all kind of link together so we will be making some of those other types of uh, information available to users of the pathways sherpa site and certainly would welcome you if you have particular areas of interest or needs one of the things we'll be doing really soon with the pathways sherpa blog we'd love to have you subscribe to it and then we'll be doing a user survey so we really understand the kinds of issues and questions that people that are reading the blog have so that we can target some of our development work around those needs Hans, your extensive, uh, long and very varied extensive um, uh, experience really comes through in this book and, and anyone that's worked with you knows also in, in anything you do. So thank you very much, not only for writing the book, but also for um, taking some time. I know this was a huge labor of love for you and, and it was exhausting. So thank you for writing the book. Thank you to you uh, who, are, who are listening today. We are very excited that you did. We know that you're excited about the book as well. Hans, what's next for you now that the book is finished? Well, the first thing to do is to clean out my office. Because <laughs> writing a book is a messy process, and I'm a paper, uh, paper hoarder. So I've got to get things organized. I'm going to enjoy continuing to be a granddad. And then I'm going to be thinking about what's next in terms of developing these kind of tools and resources to help people really make good progress on pathways, but then also exploring uh, some additional projects and, and particular users. One, perhaps, is parents and people that have, that have a connection to a young person and want to help that young person figure this out. So are there ways of adapting this broader approach and then giving some more specific information for parents, perhaps for employers. So that's a little further down the road, but immediately I've got some things to do. <laughs> I like to clean up the office yep. one. That's where I would be headed right away too. Thank you again. Thank you everyone for joining us. We have recorded this webinar in the event that you might want to share it with someone else um, and we'll be announcing that on the NC3T website soon. Take care everyone and have a good afternoon. Bye-bye Hans. Thank you Kathy. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.